cryptocurrency, DeFi, NFTs? Sounds confusing? BitLab Academy is here to help. We make it simple. Start investing in crypto, learn trading fundamentals, learn to mint and trade NFTs. Join our community today. Crypto for beginners, taught by the pros. Welcome to Rice TVX. On today's Rice Report, I am joined by returning guest, Madi Greenspan. He is a crypto OG and the founder and CEO of Quantum Economics. I will include a link down below in the video description and above for his previous appearances. Today, we're gonna to be discussing everything from the cryptocurrency markets to central banks and inflation. And then we're gonna be discussing the end of the Jewish Shemitah year and what it could mean for financial markets. Before we get into it, visit ricetvx.com and sign up for my mailing list so you never miss an update or new Rice TVX content. You will also find my various social media links and more. You can also find Rice TVX on Odyssey and Library where I have a full catalog of my videos, post up extra content and share other appearances. And you can also find Rice TVX on BitChute. Get your free half ounce of silver. Take full advantage of my partnership with Money Metals Exchange in five easy steps. One, visit moneymetals.com. Two, be a first time buyer. Three, purchase a minimum of $100. Four, use the promo code RICE. Five, get a free half ounce of silver and it's an additional way to support the channel. I will include links in the video description for everything I just mentioned as well as everything shared on today's video. Okay, joining me on today's show is a returning guest, a friend of mine. This is Mr. Crypto OG and the founder of Quantum Economics, Mati Greenspan. Mati, welcome back to Rice TVX. How's it going, my friend? What's up, dude? Not much, man. I'm definitely looking forward to the conversation. I appreciate you taking time to do this after getting back from vacation and getting back into the swing of things. So, uh, we did talk a little bit before recording and, uh, I think we're going to have a really interesting conversation, but I guess before we get into all that interesting stuff, do you mind kind of uh, playing catch up with me as to what is currently going on with quantum economics and what you guys are working on building? Yeah, certainly. So um, as you know, we do, we have done uh, a lot of research, uh, a lot of commentary in the press, uh, interviews and stuff like that. We have uh, about 35 analysts on board at the moment. Um, many of them are prolific writers, um, some of the best in the space, most talented people that I know of on the About Us page. You'll see uh, some of the talent uh, that we have working with us. And um, also on the team, we have a lot of people who are very skilled at uh, helping early stage startups especially in the crypto industry to thrive. And um, you'll see I me, mean, we've got, uh, we've recently onboarded uh, a, a expert growth hacker uh, and uh, talent acquisition. Yeah, both Anders and John, uh, they both onboarded while I was on vacation. Um, so we're basically pivoting to um, full-fledged advisory service uh, that can assist uh, new projects in uh, many ways, uh, you know, including, uh, you know, helping them put together a team, helping them with their uh, tokenomic models, um, and uh, of course, uh, VC funding and stuff like that. So um, basically just kind of a full package. And at the same time, we're partnering uh, these two, Two gentlemen's also a recent edition. Um, they actually are running a uh, startup accelerator. So, um, really, that's a, this is the direction that uh, that we're taking, um, and uh, it's something that uh, to me is very exciting. It's always always uh, been um, something that I've been very uh, very happy doing. Is just kind of um, you know 
getting into the, the meat and bones of uh, the different projects that we work with um, and uh, helping them out in, in every way that we can. Awesome. So, I mean, would this be kind of like an expansion from what you guys are currently doing or just a complete shift in direction? Um, I would say it's mostly an expansion, um, but also a bit of a shift. So uh, we're still doing um, all of the stuff that we did previously. There's nothing that we're abandoning. Obviously, there's uh, some personnel changes that we have. Um, so, you know, that uh, that that can have a way of uh, making things a bit different in the way that we work. Um, but uh, all of these uh, three um, areas, so analysis, advisory, uh, money management, uh, those are our, our general focuses, um, and uh, nothing's, nothing's changed there. Okay, that's cool. Um, and I appreciate you taking the time to explain that, man. And I always appreciate your viewpoint. You know, we had some really good conversations, and um, you were mentioning kind of getting back into the swing of things from vacation and starting to write some newsletters that you guys do. So if people are interested in signing up, subscribing for the newsletter, just sign up right here with your email address. And, um, you know, I do want to get into the topic of what you mentioned that you're going to be having your first return newsletter that you're going to be authoring about. But being that you are a crypto OG and a lot of what you deal with is cryptocurrency, uh, we are recording this on the 12th of September. I'm going to be releasing this the very next day on the 13th. Uh, we're it's also already gonna... the 13th here, buddy. Well, yeah, you're in Israel, so it is the 13th. So, okay, you're a time traveler or I'm stuck in the past. I'm not sure which one it is. But <laughs> but when it's officially the 13th here, Eastern Time, United States, um, it'll be released tomorrow. And at the same time, by the time this comes out, we'll also get the uh, CPI uh, report coming out so what are your general thoughts with cryptocurrency because what i mean by that is there's a lot of people speculating where we are in a market cycle whether we are in a traditional four-year cycle whether we're in a lengthening cycle um all sorts of different speculations even um ben armstrong pitboy has the idea of the double top theory uh, where or false top theory, excuse me, where he says the 69k top was not the correct top, and really the bear market would have begun prior to that. Um, but but can, from your experience and and you know the fact that you work with a lot of really intelligent people and you have this analysis information, where are you where are you foreseeing cryptocurrency? for the remainder of the year. I mean, we're going to be entering into Q4 here very you know, in about a month or so. Um, and that's usually a good time of the year generally, but we are in a bear market. And then, yeah, so you've got some interesting theories, but I'd like to get your, your immediate thoughts on cryptocurrency specifically. Um, yeah, I mean, I got my... Uh... Magic gate ball over here. <laughs> we can try and figure out where uh, the market's going to go, or we could just, you know, enjoy the ride. Honestly. I love the sarcasm, man. Okay, okay. <laughs> I don't. I I can't tell the future uh, any better than than the next guy. Um, but uh, you know, I, I'm I, I've bought a few dips already on the way down, um, and uh, stand ready to. Uh, buy a few more dips should they should they reveal themselves do you think that we're going to go lower than the 17.5 that we have seen so far this year uh <laughs> i think it's, it's possible i mean anything can happen um literally i mean just looking at the chart you know with the with a fresh pair of eyes uh the ten thousand stabilization rate uh that we saw pre-covid where it just kept gravitating towards that i think that that uh could serve as a very healthy long-term support line um even though people are you know claiming you know the twenty thousand, which is the, the 2017 high but 
you know, as BitBoy said, you know, 69K might not have been the real top. Maybe maybe 20,000 wasn't the real top. <laughs> I don't know what, what that even means. But um, well, I mean, there there and there are some who speculate that we've been in a bull market this entire time. And now we are finally entering into a bear market with cryptocurrency, which is an interesting theory. There's no doubt that things have been overhyped for quite a while. And I think that, you know, we all know that that has to do with uh the fed and, and their cycles of of money printing uh and you know covid and and the response to that with all of the money printing um and then people saying hey wait a second bitcoin and cryptocurrencies digital scarcity that can be you know like a some sort of a hedge against inflation um i don't know maybe if we say uh, the U.S. dollar has lost 20% of its value or 30% of its value uh, since 2020. Then, in that case, then the $10,000, which was you know a fair rate of Bitcoin pre-COVID, should now be around 12 or 13,000, and that should be probably a fair rate for Bitcoin. And there, and there are people kind of speculating that 12, 13 could be where we uh, end up in a at a low point, but uh, it's. I mean, it's going to be really interesting. I mean, um, I mentioned that by the time this video comes out, the CPI report's going to come out. Do you pay attention to those numbers? I mean, I, I do pay attention to inflation, but I don't know that the CPI is, is extremely accurate. No, I get it, but that's how the Federal Reserve and ECB and all these different central banks are judging their next move. Yeah, I think that they also look at things over time. So just a single report, even if it's a very good report, they might not necessarily take that to change course. Or even if it's a very bad report, I don't think that they're going to necessarily change things based on that. They tend to look at things like over time and the trend of where things are going. So um, we've seen all too many times where they've just ignored a specific report because it might be an outlier and you don't know until you have you know several months worth of data uh which direction the trend is heading um and you know given the most recent data i think that we understand inflation is somewhere between eight and nine percent um the data that, that i'm looking at um there's a, a website called trueflation which kind of uses blockchain data to track that and it's also right around there so um yeah, I believe that that's probably where, where we're at, somewhere around 8.5%. And um, that is extremely high as inflation goes. Um, and whether or not, you know, the Fed is, the Fed is going to continue, um, you know, their, their tightening cycle as, as much as they can. There's no, there's no doubt about that in, in my mind, at least going into the next U.S. election, uh, they need to have inflation under control by then or else it's their ass on the line. When you say next election, what election are you talking about? Because we have midterms coming up in like two months. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, the presidential election. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, no, but it, but the midterm elections are really, really important. I think that's going to potentially go. That's where all that's where I was asking you at the beginning. If you know, before we started recording, if you're paying attention to all of this, because now it seems like every single little element of everything happening affects everything else. And you yeah. really need to pay attention to everything or else you're going to kind of get lost in what's going on. Because, I mean, we have this monetary war kind of going on. Uh, between the euro and the dollar, you know, where the, where there was parity reached, uh, you could see what what the ECB is doing, uh, which reflects in Canada as well, which I think they just raised 75 basis points, which a lot of people weren't expecting uh, Fed Chair Powell to come out with his hawkish speech. Um, and that speech wasn't even really official, but people took it to heart and it really... Um, hit the markets because I think a lot of people were expecting it to ease up on the interest rates because of midterm elections and because we are seeing the inflation numbers going down, even though they're extremely high, they are going down. So even if it comes in low, here's what I'm just curious. And this is all speculation. You don't have to pull out the magic eight ball. 
<laughs> but if, it's already if, out, buddy. <laughs> if we have, I mean, you don't have to shake it up to answer this one. If the CPI numbers come in fairly low, I mean, obviously it's still going to be a high form of inflation. But if it comes in lower than last month's reported data, do you think the markets will will react negatively? Or do you think the markets are going to be in this weird state until the FOMC meeting when the Fed actually determines what rate hike they're going to do? Yeah, I think that the, um, I mean, there's always people who are going to speculate on the short term. So unless there's like some kind of real big surprise, like, you know, by two percentage points or something like that. I don't think that there's going to be any type of significant movements from the markets, just a little bit lower, a little bit higher. And even and, and even something that's 2% away can be an outlier, right? So um, I think that markets can, can they'll, they'll do what they want to do regardless of that. And then the news and, and, and pundits, you know, like, like you and me will try and, you know, back test that and go, well, did that happen because of that? Or that happened because of that? But um the truth is markets are a lot more complex than that uh and they don't rely on single data points but rather uh millions uh or, or hundreds of millions of participants who uh are, are buying and selling uh oftentimes simultaneously yeah and what's interesting about what you just said is uh i learned recently about blackrock's aladdin uh which is an ai bot uh, and now it, it's it's an AI trade. It's some sort of trading tool. Uh, but I'm understanding it's it's artificial intelligence incorporating all sorts of data points. It's able to create data points. Uh, it's able to do a quarter million trades per day. Um, billions of data points or millions of data points weekly. Uh, and then yearly forecasts. It's pretty insane. And then BlackRock has recently got access to a lot of what people will consider to be big, big data, like your personal data on people. So I feel like that can add in some sentiment elements, which would be interesting because this bot sure. or AI or whatever the hell. You make how many trades a day? It's a quarter million. And um, how much are they, how much are they charging? I wonder who's getting the commission on those quarter million trades. Well, it's, it's, I mean, they're, they're probably as well. right. Well, Aladdin, Aladdin <laughs> is, it's, it's in charge of $21 trillion worth of global assets, more than a GDP of the United States, more than a GDP of Europe. Right. Well, I hope that they're not leveraging it all on, on, on one single position. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure they're not, but because if you look at BlackRock, they have, and there's a lot of speculation as to what's going on with this, but taking people's retirement money and, 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 investing that in companies that give them seats on the board where they can help kind of push these companies into a certain direction, uh, which is kind of getting a little bit off track, the but it's financial industry is dirty. We already knew that. That's why we're here, man. <laughs> it's yeah, it's very, very, very dirty. And that's, and I feel like we're at. The and Nancy that... Pelosi is the greatest trader in the world because, you know, She's just because really she has all that inside her. information. Right. <laughs> well, isn't it technically her husband who's the greatest trader in the world? Right, 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 right. Technically, I'll, I'll, I'll believe that when my shit turns purple and tastes like strawberry sherbet. Interesting. Well, definitely take some pictures and tweet it out if that happens. <laughs> sure, I will. I'll be the first to know. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I want to ask you this. You didn't, uh, and I didn't really want you to uh, speculate on it when I had mentioned it to you before we started recording, but I was asking a few other people their um, opinions, people that I've interviewed. Gareth Soloway was one, and Lynette Zhang, she's not really in the crypto space, but she was another. And it was this thing that uh, I was mentioning about Nick Carter on an appearance from on Pompliano, Anthony Pompliano's show where Nick Carter was talking about interest rates and what's going on and saying that the Fed is in a tight spot, obviously, and the Fed can't raise interest rates to whip inflation without bankrupting everything, that there's so much sovereign and corporate debt that everything would become insolvent based off higher rates. 
In the 70s, Volcker was able to raise rates 20%, but now if we were to raise the rates 5%, the U.S. government would default. The debt to GDP is 120 as opposed to 30 in the 70s, and the deficit today is around 7% this year as opposed to 2 to 3% in the 70s. And says that the Federal Reserve is going to have to reverse course Q4 latest of this year. What are your thoughts on that statement? Well, um, certainly I think that Nick Carter is a, a very smart individual. Um, I don't think that he's smarter than Jerome Powell. Um, or, or I don't think that he necessarily knows what's going to happen better than him. I mean, from what we saw from uh, Powell's last speech, it didn't seem to be letting up in any sort of way, but rather indicating that they can continue uh, doing bring the pain. Doing. Yeah, they're like, uh, we're going to bring the pain. Yeah, but he also he was there were there were tones of we can continue tightening without making things too painful. Maybe they come up with something uh, interesting, but uh, maybe what Nick is not taking into account is the rate of inflation, which is devaluing the debt on a daily basis. So um, if inflation's at eight and a half percent, you know, then they could feasibly, you know, come up to five percent without bankrupting the nation. But on the other hand, I mean, America's been insolvent for you know decades and it, it, it as long as people believe that the dollar has value then it, it will continue to um you know a small nation like greece might get into financial troubles because people don't believe that they'll be able to pay back their debts as long as people believe that the united states will be able to continue paying back their debts uh then they will not have any trouble and powell can continue tightening those those strings as much as as much as he likes you don't think that's gonna I mean based off of every do you think that's possible i guess is what i'm thinking is what i'm asking i, I believe that yeah i it, so you mentioned the midterms and i don't think that powell's necessarily watching the midterms um the fed president's job is is uh dictated by the president of the united states so if powell has any intention of staying in the seat he, he may or he may not but if he wants to 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 keep his boss happy uh he's going to make sure that inflation is under control within the next two years um and that if that means that employment uh has unemployment has to come up so be it i mean unemployment is not that high at the moment where it would be a problem you know to 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 come up a few notches so uh if they raise rates and bring up unemployment with it i think that that for them is is a feasible strategy yeah it's just that's so keynesian i've been hearing that argument being used a lot like the increase of unemployment and it just it, it's it just it it really it sounds like a, a very very bad thing for the majority of americans i'm not really saying that i agree with it I'm oh i know you're a realist <laughs> i know it just i mean there's gonna you be it, this is not gonna be pretty any way you look at it yes uh well they put themselves in that seat when they established the federal reserve uh you know and they gave it the um unilateral authority to dictate market interest rates which in my opinion, is asinine. Yeah, I mean, what they've what's happened to the dollar since the creation of the Federal Reserve is asinine. But uh, and and to think that I'm I'm in the argument of why do we have trust that the Federal Reserve is going to be able to fix the problem that they created? They can't. No, it's a good question. It's not. It's not possible. Um, yeah. yeah, but you're the but what you're saying though is by raising the interest rates and the unemployment going up that it could be very well possible they could get the inflation under control, which would mean that they would be able to continue doing what they're doing. Now, going into a direction of a CBDC, they've been doing I think that for hundred years, Bryce. And so, to say that, like, in my opinion, America has been broken beyond repair since the seventies. Um, that's a good indication when we can't repay the gold that we owe people for sure. And it, and it, you know, and 
and the, the political divide has only gotten worse since then. And, um, you know, America's had a good run, but I don't think that it's going to remain uh, the superpower uh, that it once was or that it is today. And especially not with them, you know, as we see uh, making things hard for innovators like the crypto industry, um, just, you know, stepping on, 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 on everybody's toes, left, right, and center. I mean, even just last week we saw, you know, uh, bureau, bureaucrats uh, in the White House uh, suggesting that they should ban Bitcoin mining. Uh, yeah. And then on the other hand, you know, we see them uh, trying to label all other cryptocurrencies that are not Bitcoin as securities. So, you know, what's what's allowed in, in the United States as far as crypto is concerned? The, the mining industry. the mining thing, I was curious because I was I was on around the blockchain on BitBoy's cryptos channel last week. And um, I was curious if it had anything to do with the fact that both Russia and Iran have now legalized Bitcoin and crypto for cross border payments. You know, we can't really know what's in their minds. <laughs> I mean, I mean, because it just feels you know, like, like, the, like the sanctions that we did with the with Russia, the sanctions, they didn't they didn't seem to work in the benefit of America. They didn't no, seem to be effective. No, no, Russia is the one sanctioning going, hey, guys, <laughs> I'm not yeah. going to give you any oil. <laughs> and Europe is in a, uh, is in is in deep doo doo at the moment because of it. So, yeah. Um, but I don't think that has to do necessarily with crypto. But, uh, you know, their crypto does does play a, a part in that so i'm under this impression and you know basically you're kind of giving me the idea that you agree that the federal reserve is not going to be able to fix the problem that they created so if they go in too much of a direction of higher interest rates i feel like they're going to crash the stock market if they reverse course and start printing again they're going to inflate the market to the point that it pops and crashes is my so speculation I think there's a website called ifixedit.com i haven't been there since the since the internet started <laughs> but uh you'll see uh, if i remember oh no it's it's available for sale now darn it are you sure um, that was the url i i don't remember it was a long long time ago but it basically showed a bunch of pictures of people uh having fixed things and they were just like basically slapstick together and and obviously like they were functional, but <laughs> not exactly in the way that they were supposed to be, uh, and and certainly not aesthetic. So um, yeah, the, the 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 Fed can fix the problem, yes, by slapsticking something together, and the economy will continue running. Um, but that's not like really fixing the problem now, is it? No, it's like what they did in two thousand and eight. The, the, the Fed themselves are the problem. So the only way they'd actually be able to fix it is by disbanding themselves now i like that that's probably one of the best things i think i've ever heard you ever say in my entire life man i love that that's a good one okay well let's turn the conversation to what you were telling me before we started recording about your um your newsletter that you're writing the one sure. that, where you have you told me that normally in the past since you've done this newsletter that you would just write it and put it out that day. And this one you've been writing for a couple of days and have been marinating on it. I like to say, instead of sleeping on it, you've been marinating on it. So do you mind sharing a little bit about what you're going to be putting out in that newsletter? Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, as you know, I mean, I'm, I'm Jewish and, um, not e extremely observant, but, uh, there's a very old tradition you know, dating back to the times of uh, Joshua, where um, in the land of Israel, uh, every seventh year is known as a sabbatical year or a Shemitah year. Um, and uh, that means that basically the, the farmers have to rest the land or no growing any sort of crops, which you know, back then, you know, in, in the cradle of civilization and uh, thinking, you just, just try to imagine, you know, uh a nation who, who who's predominantly reliant on on uh agriculture uh just having nothing for 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 an entire year 
um, it just requires an immense amount of faith, but also it's a time. Um, well, didn't to, they store ahead of time though? Like, didn't they work ahead of time and have like storage of? Say, yeah, but a cucumber only lasts so long, man. Right. Okay, I get you. Okay. You know, right. I mean, you can you can uh, stockpile grain pretty well, but um, you know there there are things that you know, tomatoes or whatever they, they go bad pretty quick. Yeah. So um, it, it just it's just a time to like simmer down and you know not be so uh materialistic uh get in touch with family and just kind of appreciate uh the stuff that's around us and i think that you know um years like 2017 or, or, or 2021 and especially in, in in crypto um you know we kind of feel that um materialism like a, a lot and then uh, what I was looking at, because then I, I, I just Googled, you know, what were the last few uh, Shemitah years? And um, it actually came out like uh, 2000, 2001, 2007 to 2008, and then um, 2014, 15, and uh, 21, 22, um, all of which basically uh coincide with major financial uh crashes yeah the first one first one was dot com second one would have been the the great recession the 2008 crash what happened specifically in the 2014 2015 i'm sorry I interrupt yeah. you. and then there was the 87 uh flash crash as well which actually um if you look at it on the on on the chart was that black friday or Black yeah, Monday. Yeah, exactly. But it actually didn't happen on the Shemitah year, but actually just a few weeks after, right? Which is the same in 2007, 2008. All the problems were happening and the market started to simmer down, but then the bottom only comes in a few weeks after the new year, right? So into the next cycle. Um, and you'll see it in the chart that I'll, I'll post, but it, it basically just um, like, it, it just shows that like, it, it obviously anything that we talk about with the charts, uh, you know, I have a financial license and I am required to put the disclaimer uh, past performance does not indicate future results. So this is falls under technical analysis. Well, this is under all, this is not predicting the future. Well, but, this is not financial advice. And technically what I do is for edge, you know, for edutainment. Exactly. Exactly. So but it has an entertainment factor and, you know, people definitely always, rec you know, People need to do their own research. Don't just listen to any one voice. Correct. Correct. Um, if the cycle repeats itself, uh, within the next month or two, uh, we could see another major downturn uh, and then a bottoming out of the markets, which would uh, represent a historic uh, buying opportunity, in my in my opinion. Um, when when is well, the or it could just turn around today right up. right right well when when is this when is the actual technical end of the sabbatical slash shemitah year that would be uh september 26th rosh hashanah september 26th year. and you're saying that in past based just based off past and this doesn't mean it's going to repeat itself that usually within less than two months after the end of a shemitah sabbatical year period there is uh, a bottoming it's out. It's not an exact market. science, right? No, I get it. I get it. It literally is. I mean, you, you see the sabbatical year. You see on the graph. You see that you see the downturn starting, and then like continuing into the next year, and then bottoming out shortly after. So, I mean, dude, as I've been as much as I the look at seven crash was like a month after, like literally, like maybe maybe two weeks after. There is nothing new under the sun, and it, everything is is happens in cycles, man. So I I can't say that obviously your prediction is going to come out 100 percent here, but it's very interesting, and I've been hearing a lot about the Shemitah years. That's why when you brought up sabbatical, and I was asking you about jubilee and things to that effect, um, because I'm not Hebrew and I don't have those. Well, I think I do have some Hebrew in me, but I'm definitely not observant. Uh, at the, all. the jubilee was 2017, by the way. And see, I was told by a few by a few people that a, a jubilee follows a shemitah. 
and a jubilee know, has to do with debt, debt every forgiveness. Years. And this has nothing to do with the uh, with Britain's jubilee, the jubilee year. This is a totally different thing. So. No, because I think they're currently experiencing or just finished out their jubilee. Like the queen died in the jubilee year. But that has nothing to do with the Hebrew faith as far as I'm concerned because I don't see a lot of alignment between Protestants, Catholics, and Hebrews except for God. Where it originated, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just a lot of war. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, I mean, I definitely take this you know, very, very much in consideration. And when you take out the equation of – the sabbatical or the sabbatical shemitah year and just look at what's going on all signs you could get the you can get the ball out now because all signs point to yes <laughs> is what i'm saying all signs point to yes <laughs> it's going to be a problem i mean when you look at everything that's going on when you look at what what's happening with the russia ukraine crisis there are uprisings all over the world all over the world it's not just yeah. in a few few places. I'm I, I haven't been paying attention to Israel. How and I know you just got back. How are things in Israel as far as uh because it's not too far away from Actually, Europe. Really, really good, and I'll tell you why. Okay. Uh, Donald Trump brokered a peace agreement between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. Um, Dubai. I don't know if you've ever been to Dubai. No, I want to. I really do want to go, but I didn't know that there was. I've been there three times. So there's peace. And that's in... only since that, that we now have a direct flight, which has never never been possible before. In the last two years, we have there's I think four airlines flying direct Tel Aviv to Dubai, and um, Dubai is an incredible uh, economic hub. And Israelis are going there all day long <laughs> and, vice, and vice versa. And we're doing a lot of business together. And I've been there uh, during regular times. And I've been there when shit was going down in Gaza. And when the shit's going down in Gaza, if you say you're from Israel, you start getting looks. <laughs> right. And while things, well, nothing's happening, then it, it's okay. Yes, you're my brother. We're all friends. Let's do business together. So imagine all of those business ties, right, that have been building up over the last two years, and all of a sudden, shit starting in Gaza and Hamas is throwing rockets and Israel is retaliating. All of a sudden, all those business dealings and all the people that are in the same room, things can start getting awkward. Oh, no, I get it. Yeah. So no. uh, Dubai put pressure on Qatar, who put pressure on Hamas to stop fucking around. Okay, but just but the, the peace last, agreement, but the peace agreement was we would only, be having, we would be at war right now if that wouldn't have happened. But the peace agreement was only for the UAE and Israel, but the UAE is putting pressure on the rest of the Middle Eastern nations. So it's not a technical technical peace accord. No, but, but Hamas was starting shit while I it, it, just in August, and they were throwing rockets, and Israel started to retaliate, and then. Uh, this last month, fine, yeah. So that was that was the, the the story that was going around. UAE put pressure on Qatar, who put pressure on Hamas to stop. Interesting. And it went away, and here we are. When when are those guys going to get into crypto? I mean, I know that they're like inching <laughs> into it, but when is that? It's when not is inching, that... man. They're balls deep. I like to call it Arab money. When is that Arab money going it's, in? I, it's there, I shout it's out. already there, man. It's way ahead of you, dude. They're not. They're not. They're not slow. They're. Uh, um, well, they're I'm, talking about sovereign. What is it? What was it? I'm. It's not sovereign money, but something that a lot of people have been speculating on. Billions and billions of dollars coming into. Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, which hasn't fully taken place yet. I mean, I'm sure that there's people that are that own cryptocurrency, but like as far as like a full on deal. And then something else that I found really interesting is that, uh, and I didn't really understand a lot about this, but Muslim nations, and I didn't know that this had a lot to do with the banking problems. Muslim nations don't want to deal with anything that deals with usury or debt. 
Correct. Which is one of the reasons why I believe a lot of these Muslim nations are pro Bitcoin and pro cryptocurrency because there's no debt involved. Correct. Which Correct. is fascinating to think about that because uh, we're so accepting about all this debt and usury that has made us these, like, as far as I'm concerned, slaves to this entire system, dude. Yeah. It, the, I mean, I don't know. So, um, Christians and Catholics and Protestants, uh, um, oh all, you know, uh, believing in Jesus to us, uh, are, are infidels. Um, honestly, you know, the, the Jews and Muslims, uh, pray to the exact same God. We, we, we both, uh, both our, our nations realize this. Um, and, um, we have a very similar, uh, laws about, collecting interest and charging interest, uh, to your fellow. Um, I was speaking with last time I was in Dubai, uh, DeFi project that was completely halal. Um, and in essence, uh, when you do it the DeFi way, um, it's actually more, uh, Sharia compliant than anything that the traditional finance financial sector can offer. What was halal? Halal, uh, kosher. That, that kosher. kosher. So that would be like non debt, non usury based. Basically, yeah. Like um, it's all good. It's all kosher. Yes, because you're when you're you're lending money to a pool, right? Um, and I, you know, don't don't quote me on the on the exact way this this structure works. It was explained to me by somebody who. Uh, you know, has has a vast knowledge in, in the Quran. Um, but basically when you're you're lending money to a pool uh, and the pool has um, is giving access to those to that to those funds uh, for liquidity purpose, um, it's basically just taking a cut of the transactions that are happening on the network for which liquidity is uh, facilitating. And in that case, you're not lending your money to somebody else who's giving you interest for it, uh, but you're actually putting your money into a pool and participating uh, in the profit sharing that's happening on the network. So somebody creates a transaction, they're paying a fee, you're not paying it to a centralized party like a bank, and then the bank pays you whatever the, they want, right? right. And they don't tell, they're not transparent about where, you know, what they're charging, who they're charging or whatever. But actually, the network is completely transparent. You can see that fee came in, and then it was then allocated to all those who are providing liquidity to the network. So, uh, which is voluntary that, too. Uh, well, vol voluntary has nothing to do with it. Voluntary, okay. even if it's interest that's paid voluntarily, uh, that that would still be considered usury, uh, both in in Judaism and in uh, Islam. Okay. Well, it's really interesting. I mean, it's fascinating that, that we've even had this conversation because it, it, it seems like the the Muslim-based countries take this a lot more seriously than anybody else. It, like, has the has the Jewish people pretty much just kind of succumbed to the world? We have. Is that really, <laughs> I what it comes down to this argument with my rabbi when I was very young, and I said, "Wait a second, I'm how are you? How, how do you have a bank account?" <laughs> the bank account he's offering interest rate that's clearly not allowed and his answer was well that's, that's the way of the world that's how we have to do it so what, what are you gonna do reinvent the banking system and i said yeah we reinvent the banking system and that's what we're doing here today yeah that's a beautiful thing that's a beautiful thing well i mean technically the banking system is being reinvented though i mean like i, I don't know if you've been looking into this iso 20022 stuff it's like an oh, upgrade to swift Batman an upgrade okay. to swift you should look into it because there's some chosen cryptocurrencies that are part of their system their ecosystem and then you have uh what's going on with the BRICS nation banks creating their reserve currency i mean it's, a, it's as if we're going to have these these parallel systems they're going to have to interconnect in some fashion which is where i think the technology the blockchain technology are kind of coming to play which will be interesting because I think you know, like earlier too, like going back minorly to like the Federal Reserve, I feel like the central banks will have a lot easier of a time manipulating numbers and keeping the system going longer if it was fully digital and in a CBDC type environment. 
Do you agree it with would, that? But it would also make it more traceable and more difficult for them to get away with their shenanigans. It wouldn't be an open system. Though. Which it would I'm be, pretty it would sure be, is why they haven't done it already. <laughs> it would be a closed system. They wouldn't use an open, transparent, public blockchain. Ah, so then it's already digital if that's your if that's your intention, right? If it's open source, then that's then everybody can kind of see what's going on and chain analysis can come in and do a deep dive and figure out, you know, how Powell's money is is uh, eventually coming to his cronies. But um, if it's a closed digital system, and I think that so it already is a closed digital system. It's just it is, it is, but it's going fully digital. So I, I to get ready to wrap things up, one of the last things I want to mention is that um, I've been hearing a lot of things about the obsolescence. I'm not even sure if I'm saying that right. Making cash obsolete. And I know that that's kind of been an agenda, but now there are businesses like apparently there are airlines that are not accepting credit cards that are making you to pay through applications. And there are businesses now that are just going cash. I mean, that are not accepting and allowing for cash in any capacity. And the more that we have businesses getting in on, on that whole deal, then people aren't really going to have a choice in the matter. And that's where, I've, I've even heard a lot of people who are very much into freedom, you know, who definitely don't like the Federal Reserve saying right now you need to be using cash. You know, everybody needs to be using cash and not using debit and credit cards and things to that effect and use cash everywhere you go and make. Yeah. Make China's gone cashless m nearly a decade ago. And with the meet with the we me and all that or whatever the yeah, social WeChat media stuff. And WeChat, and yeah. And those, they yeah, they've basically been doing mobile payments about a decade. Uh, yeah, and then they, you got the social credit score. Anybody stuff. who visits China uh, will tell you you can't pay with cash for nearly anything. Like you have to, like if you try to if you try to give them a paper money, they look at you like you're from Mars. Um, you dirty criminal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, I had that experience in Amsterdam one time. I went to, a, I think it was, I don't remember what, Primark. In, in Amsterdam and like I tried to pay with a 200 euro note and they're like I'm sorry we don't accept this and I'm like it's euros this country is built is is except zeros but they're like yes but those high bills are associated with uh, mafia and criminal activity and I'm like are you calling me a criminal no 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 we don't know but, but you know but we don't accept them <laughs> like I had to literally go into the casino to break the 200 like oh that's literally, crazy literally i had to go into the casino who i'm quite certain was associated with the mafia and criminal activity uh you know to uh to break the note and then spend it at primark that is absolutely ridiculous uh there was one more thing that i did want to ask real quick and i don't know if you know the answer but how prepared is israel and and surrounding areas when it comes to a potential global food shortage issue. Oh, we're, 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 we're stocked, man. <laughs> we, uh, Israel is, uh, you know, how in America you, you guys make fun of the people who are like preparers or like, what do you call them? People well, who build bunkers under their, you know, they call them preppers. I, preppers, I, I right? I'm kind of in that crowd. I don't have an underground bunker, but <laughs> Is, every, yeah. is everybody a prepper in, in Israel? So Israel is a nation of preppers. Um, we've been, you know, faced eradication uh, in the uh, 1930s and 40s. So yeah, um, I heard about that event. Yeah, we've we've been we've you know, since we have our own sovereign nation now, we, we're uh, pretty much prepared for any eventuality. Um, as soon as as soon as COVID struck, I mean, yeah, Benjamin Netanyahu, and you know uh, the Israelis got swept up in in the, in the whole toilet paper shenanigans, and uh, Netanyahu came on the TV. He's like, "Guys, are you are you fucking nuts? Like, we've got enough toilet paper, we've got enough food. Everybody, relax. We can go on for a very long time." Uh, are you guys so allowing people in the country right now? Like, if shit hits the fan, I can just come over to Israel and I'll be good to go. It'll be GTG. <sighs> um. I out, think, I'll, yeah, I'll at the time of COVID, card. there was actually, I was very disappointed that there were Jews that were not able to get into the country for a few 
I would say it was only, but it was only a very short period. It was like only a few weeks. Um, Jewish people are always able to get into the country. Uh, we've sent out missions to, to, to grab Jewish people out of uh, Ethiopia and other uh, dangerous areas uh, in the past. It's, it's one of the hallmarks that, um, that, that we do. That's commendable. Pull your, pull your people out and bring them home. That's awesome. That's beautiful. I definitely want to. We only have one nation, man. I mean, the Christians got some 25, Muslims got like 30. Uh, We only have one country and uh, we're going to, we're going to fight to keep it that way. Smart. No, it makes sense, my friend. It does. Uh, And I appreciate you sharing that. I mean, it's going to be an interesting times ahead. I mean, when it comes to uh, what's happening with the dollar, the inflation, the, the, the strengthening of the dollar and how other fiat currencies are comparing against it, which, you know, a lot of people, that's the, that's the worst thing that I look at when I see like the Dixie hitting all time high numbers or just hitting these directions it's in it. It's an indication that other nations are in a worse position. Yeah. Uh, Cause that's the only, that's the only way to judge the the dixie is comparing it to other fiat currencies so if it's up other fiat currencies are down and that's why you're seeing like double digit inflation in in england and other parts of europe all of foreign exchange and i realized this quite quite a while ago is only betting on which currency is going down the fastest um fiat money is designed to go down that's what inflation is they're not even hiding it they're not even like it's not, it's not even a secret they're like yes we want our currency to go down by two percent a year oh it's going down by eight that's too much oh it's going down by one percent we need to make it go down faster so when you play the forex market you're only betting on which one is going to drop fastest to be, to be or or you're hoping for reevaluations, like some people which but is- what i will say and especially with fears that you know Europe could be completely without energy this winter, and all of the you know and the the the, the tech uh, hub in India just got flooded, and you know um, it's just shit hitting the fan like you mentioned all over the world. Uh, I do want to say that over time, the world has been improving, and it has been improving quite steadily, and. Certainly the media likes us to go nuts because that's where they make their money by us, you know, going nuts and clicking on stuff where they make, you know, advertisement dollars. Um, And in the markets, specifically for investors, it pays to be optimistic. I do remember in 2012, people literally thought the world was going to end and it didn't. And in 2000, people literally thought the world was going to end. And it didn't. Um, and you know what? If it does, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> you can do about it if that's really the case. Exactly. So why do you, why do you care if you're uh, <laughs> tied up in a market that crashed? Because like, who cares, right? As long as you've got uh, you know a few few gold coins to hawk, you, you should be you should be okay. Um, but uh, literally, I mean, there's there's no reason to start pulling your money out of the markets. Um, anybody who thinks long-term uh, should understand that, yes, you might get a better buying opportunity if you hold out for a few few more weeks, but um, selling your assets, I mean, that just that's just craziness in my, in my opinion. Well, I appreciate you sharing that, man. I definitely enjoyed the conversation. Uh, I will have links down below for Quantum Economics website for your personal Twitter, uh, for the QE Twitter account. Is there anything else you want to add to the conversation? Anything you want to share about QE or anything before we do wrap up today? No, man. I mean, I, we, we've got a lot of things going on and <laughs> it's far too late in the conversation to bring them all up. So uh, definitely just you know, subscribe right there where it says email and, and hit the subscribe now and, and you'll, be in, you'll be in the loop with all of those things. Right here. Yes. As right well here. As- my thoughts on the Shemitah year and uh, all, all that jazz. Well, I found it to be fascinating. I mean, I really enjoyed the conversation. And um, every time I talk to you, I say we got to make sure we're having a conversation sooner than later. So I'm going to make sure that I stay on top of that. I'm going to write a note to myself and make sure I get you back on in the next like 
40, 40 days or so, maybe 45, but I'll definitely get you back on. Cause I mean, I really think there's some interesting times ahead and curious what's going to happen with uh, the FOMC meeting and how that's going to affect the markets. And based off what you've been saying though, with, with the, with the Shemitah information, really kind of goes into play with what I'm thinking with the Federal Reserve because the Federal Reserve raises the rate hike of 75 basis points or a full basis point uh, and then repeat that. But you need, but you're right, so you need a catalyst. Right? You, can you define, can you explain? So all, all market crashes, they have a catalyst. Yeah, our, our debt market it's, it's looks like a catalyst. The camel's back. Our debt market looks like that. The treasury. No, no, bond. that's not a catalyst. Okay. That is the straw. It's literally the straw itself. Like that's like the pile of straw is the debt market. So the, the the camel is sitting there, right, with his back under a huge pressure, right? But there needs to be something that comes and goes boom and knocks the whole the whole thing over. And um, you know, in, in two thousand and eight, I think it was, you know. Uh, like Lehman Brothers, for example, going under, and that was like a catalyst, right? Right. Um, in, in this case, I mean, you, you have to have something that uh, triggers it, like a singular event. You you can't really know what it'll be in 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 advance. Well, that would be a sort of a black swan in that sense, right? Usually, yeah. I mean, it could be a it could be derivatives crashing. It could be uh, a nation like China whose real estate is completely defaulting. It could be all the above. It could it could already be in the process of. Because that's yeah. what it feels like. It feels like if it's if this is a dam, the dam is full of a lot of cracks and it's about to break. And it's just a matter of where in the dam, what what point of pressures? Because it seems like there's so much pressure already being put onto the camel. Yeah. It's like I'm I'm one like that's one hell of a strong camel right now that we're, that we're dealing with because it's it's got the weight of the world on its back. Yeah. Yeah. Literally. Wow. It's it's crazy to think about because like with all the things that are happening, what what could that catalyst be? <laughs> you so, don't know, we don't know no. until it happens. Um, but also it might not happen, in which case happy camel crosses the desert. And I think that um the smart money will bet on that every single time uh, and then prepare for the eventuality that if the camel's back does break, we'll, we'll, we'll bring in a new camel and uh, or, or we'll reinforce the dam. Uh, just just turn, this, turn them into a cyborg camel and I think we'll be good to go. <laughs> <laughs> because da dams crack all the time, right? And as long as you don't like let them completely, uh, you know, bust, like you'll be, you'll be all right. I just feel like this is the the big bust. I, I don't know. I just like if if we're at the end of a fiat cycle, we're gonna have to have some new system of money. We're gonna. It's like we're, we're gonna have to have a new financial system. It, a reset seems to make sense. And you know, and then you see all the World Economic Forum gibberish with Great Reset and all this rhetoric being pushed out from Davos. It's it's like what's what's what the hell's going on? What's is is the jubilee right the jubilee was when when the retail market uh bought into bitcoin 2017 2018 that's the debt reset that is that is that is it right there right and then um everybody who's uh you know uh i believe that the next bitcoin uh cycle so we've had you know first was early adopters 2013 uh, 14, that's when I got in, uh, 2017 was the retail market. And then, um, 2021 was institutional money. The next cycle is central banks, man. And it's already starting to happen. Uh, the groundwork is being laid, uh, central banks in, in, in Africa, for example, and, uh, South America will be first, which is the awesome part because, um, they'll be able to get in, uh, quite early on, on, on that. Uh, America's uh, Federal Reserve is going to be the absolute last one to to, to buy Bitcoin, um, which I think is 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 going to be completely and uh, deliciously uh, ironic. Yeah, but I also think about all the government, all the seized Bitcoin by the government too, and what and what that might be utilized potentially for. Are they holding a reserve in, in, in or, the moment? Or it, or 
or in the government. I don't. I, I'm not sure. I think that uh, I think there's still a big release of uh, some of the Silk Road Bitcoin. I don't think it's been released yet. The big, the big load of it. And there's talk about the Mount Gox stuff, which I'm not sure how that'll be offloaded. That's not the U.S. though. Mount Gox was Japan. Right, right. No, I'm just, I'm just mentioning things out of my ass. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. The other, the other idea is that. Already. Is that Satoshi Nakamoto was our was was the NSA or a branch of our government? It was part of our government, and it could be that the Satoshi stash could be our stash. You know, who knows? I don't know. It's a lot of really interesting speculation when it comes into things like that. I don't know, man. I, I suppose it's possible, but um, I'm I'm pretty sure Satoshi's dead, man. A lot of people speculate that pretty sure about it but we like again nobody knows and that's the beautiful thing about it well the magic eight ball knows the magic eight ball knows everything <laughs> it's all right dude well, alive. i really appreciate the conversation if you can bear with me real quick just gonna wrap up so all ladies right. and gentlemen uh, again make sure you're checking out quantum economics website make sure you're following matisse yahoo greenspan on his twitter account as well as quantum economics on twitter everything will be linked down below uh, i'll even include a link for that website that you were talking about the truflation.com so people can check that out as well if you guys are not subscribed to rice tvx i ask what are you waiting for make sure you're subscribed do appreciate you tuning in and i will leave you with this be a blessing to others Treat people how you want to be treated. Be the change that you want to see in this world. Practice change. Much love.